you see the recording screen on? Is it yeah, recording? Yes. Great. So you know what the course is. You know who I am. Uh, lesson four, uh, Christian beliefs. What does Christianity have to say about death and the afterlife? And also, I want to reiterate that we're talking about, we're, we're almost personifying a religious tradition. You know, something that's very complex and a moving target and multi-millennia old. Um, and so, as with anyone with age, you'll believe different things at different times, um, maybe influenced by different people. So, what does Christianity believe, right? The reason I don't say what do Christians believe necessarily is that people believe a variety of things, whether or not it accords with canon or not, or their tradition or not. So, well, what is Christianity? So in teaching world religions, um, it's always a challenge to, to convey sort of the depth and the richness and the dynamism of a religious tradition. Um, having said that, <laughs> the Abrahamic faiths are a bit of a boon as is Buddhism. Why? They're centered around a founder, a founder situated in time. Uh, about whose biography we, we know certain things. Um, certain things we're not so sure, but Hinduism, for example, doesn't have a founder. Taoism, for example, doesn't have a founder. Aboriginal traditions, for example, don't have a founder. So what is Christianity? Well, Christianity is essentially this religion that starts with this person we know as Jesus Christ. Now, we're looking at, you know, four, I believe, of the world's religious traditions, Christianity, Islam, you know, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism. And part of the rationale is just a sheer crude numbers game. As I've said before, and I'll say again, the number of adherents is in no way a correlation of the importance, the intrinsic importance, or the vitality, or, or the philosophical merit of a religious tradition. This is a crude numbers game that falls into this conceit of world religions. Christianity, the adherents of Christianity for various social and historical reasons, number in 2.4 billion individuals, okay? I can't count that high. <laughs> I bet most of you can't. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. Hugely, hugely influential religion, particularly in the Western world. Uh, you know, Canada is a secular, uh, country, but it certainly, most certainly has a Christian backdrop. Why do we have Easter off, for example? Why do we have Christmas Day off, for example? So, you know, Christianity, um, we can say, um, centers around, is based on the life, the example, the teachings of one Jesus. Or Jesus, of, or Jesus of Nazareth. Now, in the ancient world, it's not quite the same where you might be, you know, John Smith. There wouldn't be quite the Smith there. There would be, you know, John's son of David, right? And maybe that translates, you know, if your last name is Davidson, for example, you know, son of David, probably somewhere in your ancestry. Now, this Jesus of Nazareth was arguably the most, or certainly one of the most influential figures in all of recorded history. Top 10, easily. Not necessarily in his times, but certainly since his times, right? He, like all human beings, he is born into a cultural context. Okay, fine, you know, um, uh, Billy the Believer, uh, God is eternal and these truths last forever and ever, amen. You know, W the doubter or the, or the rationalist or, or the reductionist would be like, okay, everything has a cause. Nothing comes from a vacuum. What were the social and historical causes <laughs> that gave rise to the mission and the mandate of Jesus of Nazareth? And he may say, oh my God, social and historical causes? Do you not understand he was anointed by God on high? You see, these characters, right? They're part of us, they're part of our culture, they're part, they're part of life, right? And so, whether or not we believe in a divine, uh, whether we do believe in a divine, certainly um, there is agency in uh, experiences and the world and the ways and way, way we relate to our own culture, right? Uh, 
that's going to be true. There are some thinkers like Cl Clifford Geats who will say, well, religion is a cultural thing. It's a phenomenon of culture. There are thinkers, um, 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 uh, all kinds from uh, religious studies, uh, you know, Merce Eliade, um, uh, all kinds who want to say, look, there is a sense of a sacred. We won't get too nerdy because I did say everything I talked about in lecture will be on the test. But I'm not going to test you on religious theorists that aren't talked about in the book. I assure you. My point is that culture and sociology and society is important. And Jesus of Nazareth was born in ancient Israel. He was born in a Jewish family. He was raised Jewish. He adopted a Jewish worldview. He lived in a Jewish paradigm with the beliefs and rituals and practices, you know, that, 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 that constitute that paradigm. Now, in addition to that, you know, um, Israel is now a modern nation state, but then um, Israel, Israel, the people, the covenant tribe of Israel, they were always ruled by someone else. You know, this is part of the narrative of pardon me, part of the narrative of, 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 of Israel is a people in exile. The idea of the diaspora, the scattering of the seeds. We roam the earth and, 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 and you know, uh, they are in this time period, in this part of the world where Jesus was born, they're ruled, they're ruled, <laughs> they're ruled by the Romans. Yes, the Romans. And so, Roman culture, Roman society, Roman law, that's also part of the life, the formation of Jesus of Nazareth. Of Jesus of Nazareth. You may be in Calgary, certainly Canadian law and, and this, this regime will impact your life and your thinking, certainly Western civilization will. You may have a religious background that's different. You may be Sikh, whatever, for, as an example. That will also impact who and what you are, right? So this layers to the onion of the formation of a person, right? This is important to keep in mind. Now, who was this, 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 this highly influential figure? Um, like, who was he? You know, uh, you know, he's no slouch. Clearly, you know, his brain worked or at least his, his ability to, to respond or, 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 or sort of think in a pedagogic way. You know, he, he certainly from what we know of him, if the records, uh, if the accounts of him are to be believed, certainly he was a teacher. Clearly he was a Socrates-like figure who would engage in dialogue and, and, and more than just Socratic questioning, he would have a message, a spiritual message. But he's a Jew, right? So was he a rabbi? You know, was he a Jewish reformer? Was he someone that's working to reform the tradition? Was he someone that was working to undercut the tradition? Was he a radical, and uh, an iconoclast, to use a very Christian term, a revolutionary of sorts? Who was Jesus of Nazareth? Was he a, a prophet the way that um, Abraham was a prophet? The way later in Islam we'll hear that um, Muhammad is a prophet. And Islam will say that, well, Jesus was a prophet of the one true God. You know, did he have a special relationship with the divine that he came to the earth with a message for humanity at the behest of God on high? You know, was he some sort of wise spiritual man? You know, he seemed to have the ability and audacity to interpret the scriptures himself. You know, to, 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 to grapple with their meaning, he, he seemed to fancy himself or, or at least indicate or operate as if he was an authority on what the scriptures are saying, that he could separate the wheat from the chaff. Now, in, in, in Jewish tradition, as we talked about last class, it's very much about the law, about the Torah. It, there's a very litigious dimension of parsing out what God means. Says God created this world, God set out his law, and he'll be back at the end of days. And in the meantime, we better understand the law. How else are we going to live in accord with the will of God? How else are we going to be saved at the end of days, right? But he fancied himself or operated as if he was able to discern the meaning of scriptures. You know, one of the themes that we talked about at the beginning of the course was, 
whether we should go by beliefs, records, teachings, or whether we should go by our personal experience. You know, my, um, I'm Roman Catholic and my tradition tells me, look, um, this whole reincarnation thing is bupkis, uh, but uh, someone in my family has past life memories. Do I go by my experience or, or better yet, I have them? My experience or do I go by canon? And this is a real tension. And this tension doesn't go away because there are individuals like Jesus of Nazareth that end up starting, unwittingly starting an entirely new religious tradition. There are other individuals who very successfully reform their religious tradition, bring change. Martin Luther, for example, who we'll talk about next time, all kinds of examples. Um, Mahatma Gandhi in Hinduism, all kinds, right? There's this fine line between reformation and revolution. Now history records that, you know, uh, wise man or not, he certainly ended up being the, the founder of a new religious tradition. A religious tradition that saw him as more than a wise teacher, certainly more than a rabbi, uh, even more than a prophet. They saw him as a son of God. Now, what does that mean, son of God? What could that possibly mean? You know, part of what's interesting about the reception of Jesus was that he was born in a culture with this concept of a messiah. And this is the word that we take for granted, and we may have an understanding of what that might mean. Uh, we may, you know, it's maybe even um, used in common parlance in terms of like a messianic complex, for example. Um, you know, but there's a very specific uh, religious connotation to this, uh, this strand of Abrahamic, i.e. of Abraham, the quote-unquote founder of Israel because of his covenant with God. This core strand of Abrahamic thought, um, philosophy, ideology, is that there is an anointed one who will come to save us from oppression. Yep. And his coming will mark the end of days. The end of days when the dead shall be resurrected. Right? And this ties into what I was talking about, about eschatology in the, this context in the Abrahamic context, and, and Judaism, Christianity, and Islam could be, are considered Abrahamic traditions because they all stem from, and they all um, um, comment on, they all, they all are evolutes of uh, uh, the covenant of Abraham with this very powerful um, divine figure. Now, because this concept was so crucial the day. Um, it, it was, it, it's completely understandable that somebody with, um, uh, with Jesus's um, reported abilities and his wisdom and his maybe charisma that, that, that one would think, okay, well, he's the Messiah. You know, he's the one who's come to emancipate our people, the Jewish people. He's the one who's come to usher in the end of days. Like clearly, what else could he be? What else could such a one be? And, 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 and just to my point about, um, uh, about humans not living in a vacuum, that um, so much can be learned about understanding uh, the society, the culture, the history. The simple idea that Messiah, the Hebrew word for Messiah, uh, in Greek is Christos, and there's a lot of texts in the early church in, in Greek. That was the language of the day. For example, uh, a thinker now may write in English, a spiritual person now may write in English. You know, Greek was the language of the day. Messiah, Christos, in our modern English world, Christ. So Christ isn't Jesus' last name. He's Jesus, son of Joseph, or Jesus of Nazareth, or, you know, but Christ is his title. So Queen Elizabeth, you know, Elizabeth Rex, or it wouldn't be Rex, that's masculine. I don't know Latin. The point is, that, 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 you know, General Raj, right? The point is, he's Jesus Christ. He's Jesus, the anointed one. 
He's Jesus, son of God. Yeah, this comes from a Jewish context. This, 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 this status uh, to which he's accorded doesn't come out of nowhere. Right, it's it's from the the social um, and religious pressures at play in his cultures and his time. Now, every once in a while, well, not every once in a while, every class, I'll share the um, glossary terms because they're important. Right, those are those are obviously somebody will probably test you in the glossary terms. Christ, the title given to Jesus of Nazareth, whose followers believe that he was the Messiah sent by God to free the faithful. Moving beyond Jewish expectations, right, right? There's a piece that's Jewish and there's a piece that's transformed, right? And then the question of well, what's legitimate and what is, um, what is an aberration thereof? This is a question, but, 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 but tradition is dynamic. You have to make this decision all the time. You know, uh, sent by God, moving beyond the Jewish expectations, Jesus Christ is believed to have been an incarnation of God as his son on earth, and that he proved his teachings through the miracle of his own resurrection and has promised to return again at the last day to judge the living and to resurrect the dead. And to judge the resurrected dead. Now, incarnation sort of it sort of calls up in most of us this idea of reincarnation, and this idea, you know, the specific sort of Indian concept of rebirth and karma is very particular, and we'll talk about that. But broadly speaking, reincarnation incarnation means embodiment. Think of carnal pleasures of the flesh. Incarnation means being embodied in the flesh. So somehow he was an embodiment of God. This is the sense in which he was the son of God, you know, as a, as a messenger, as a savior, as an embodiment of God on high. Yeah. Now, what's interesting is that although there is obviously this tradition of, 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 of leaning on the, of drawing from the, the, this, this Jewish idea of, of, the Messiah, you have to understand in Jesus' time, there was no Christianity. <laughs> so there was no, of course it was a Jewish idea, right? Now we can say, well, that's a Jewish idea. That's a Christian idea. In Jesus' time, that distinction simply didn't exist. Yeah. So, but, but eventually, we'll talk about more of the history of this in the next class. Today, I want to give you some, um, some, some major concepts. Um, uh, eventually, what the Hebrews called the Tanakh, the, 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 the Jewish Bible, right? Um, the Christians call the Old Testament. Why is it the Old Testament? Well, because they have a New Testament, right? They have these gospels, these, these, these accounts of the life and times and miracles and character of Jesus of Nazareth, indeed Jesus Christ, the four gospels, right? The Acts of the Apostles, the Epistles, and the Book of Revelation, which is, you know, hair-raising at certain parts. That's a story for another day. Um, so you see, there's this, there's this tradition. I'm trying to communicate this idea of dynamism and tradition. It's always changing, right? Pressures, pressures to adapt to the times. Religion is not rigid. Perhaps truth is, perhaps God is, perhaps being is, who knows? Religion, insofar as the aspects of which we can study, is not rigid. If it was, there wouldn't be so many things for you to have to remember. <laughs> <laughs> that have occurred throughout the ages, you see? Now, you know, it, 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 Jesus was a remarkable individual. Um, but, you know, one may say, you know, um, you know, you're remarkable. You write so many books, you coach people, you do this and this and this. Great, sure, fine. I don't turn water into wine, right? You know, I do do a fair bit of healing work, but I don't heal, I don't touch someone with leprosy and then they, they don't have leprosy anymore. I don't take a couple of loaves and be able to feed the entire city or village or, or, or neighborhood. I certainly can't raise the dead, right? These are miraculous abilities ascribed to Jesus of Nazareth. Now, Billy the Believer is whispering in my ear and he's like, what do you mean ascribe? What the hell are you talking about? Those are the miracles of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ you ascribe. What's wrong with you? They're, they're real. They're true. People saw them. We have four gospels, not just one, four people. 
and they all report having seen these miracles. And you're sitting here telling the students that they were ascribed to him, we're not sure. And then Debbie the doubter comes in and is like, well, well, wait a minute, what evidence do we have? We've got these, these, these accounts that are a couple thousand years old. You know, you call them miracles, I call it mythology, tomato, tomato, there is not a religious tradition on the planet where there isn't some kind of super normal, supernatural powers at play to the key figures of that religious tradition. There's not a religious tradition on the planet where that, that supernatural status of that figure doesn't somehow, somehow confer upon them a, a, a relationship with the divine, the supreme spirit, God, whatever. This isn't new. This is just, uh, you know, right? So that can play in your head all you want. I believe the fifth. <laughs> But uh, unlike Judaism, Christ Christianity has a, a, a much more fleshed out understanding of the afterlife that the book talks about. We're all familiar with heaven and hell, right? Like this comes from this period of time where, you know, hell is, is where you go for torment, you know, the fires of hell, right? Um, the, the previous Jewish uh, concepts are indeed used. For example, uh, Shoal, you go there for judgment, and then after that, you go to heaven or hell, right? So you see there's a, a, a renovation and innovation to the existing afterlife narrative. There's this sort of, there's still this idea of Gehenna or this, this sort of these horrors of hell. So you can see that the ideas are shifting and they're folding in materials from Greek ideas, right? But they're not breaking away with Jewish ideas. In fact, you know, the vast majority of Christians will readily spout um, scripture from the Jewish Bible and or the Old Testament, right? So heaven, a state of being with God, obtained after resurrection by those who have committed themselves to following the teachings of Jesus Christ. See, attain, obtained after resurrection. One needs to preserve this idea that, well, we're going to be sort of in suspended animation or something or somewhere forever and ever until we're all resurrected at the end of days. At that time, the righteous will go to heaven and the unrighteous, well, guess what? They'll be damned, literally. They're going to go to hell. What's hell? Well, it's the state or place of eternal damnation expressly mentioned by Jesus in the Gospels as the fate after resurrection of those who do not follow him. This is key. It's not like, oh, I die and I go to the pearly gates or, or not. It's I die and I'm in suspended animation or something. Or we're waiting until the end of days when our ultimate fate is tied to the ultimate fate of this universe that was consciously created by this one God, as I narrated to you in the book of Genesis uh, last class. This is important. Well, you know, purgatory. Well, what the heck's that? Purgatory. The state described by the church fathers. We'll go into this next class. I just wanted to give you all of the terms in this class. We'll talk about the church fathers next class. The state described by the church fathers. See, this is a later development. It's dynamic, right? As the temporary fate of all people after death, during which the dead are punished by degrees to purge and purify them, for the coming resurrection in heaven or eternal damnation, as the case may be. Well, this idea, well, when heaven, hell, like, so what, I stole some bread, I murdered somebody, like, am I, is it the same for everybody? Right? There need, it, it can't be a switch. It has to be a dial on some level. Yeah, like, it has to be a little more nuanced than that, you know? So this idea of purgatory, you know, comes along. Now, the afterlife is... Yeah. You know, Jesus describes the afterlife as, as, as difficult, the, 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 the heaven, whatever we conceive that to be, to be in the lap of the Lord is not an easy task. It's not something that somebody can just chance upon by being an unthinking oaf. It's something that takes some kind of scrupulous attention, some care. It's a narrow path. It's the razor's edge that you're made to tread upon right? The path to heaven is narrow. Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. 
and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. This is the narrow path of the few who are able to conduct themselves virtuously in some way, shape, or form in accordance to the teachings. Yeah. And, you know, the masses are going to hell. <laughs> this is what he's saying. He's saying this is a narrow gate. You know, all have an opportunity. Few, few take the opportunity. And so few get this reward because the reward is the result of work. It's a result of care. It's a result of exerting, uh, exerting yourself in accordance with scripture, with teachings of examining your life, right? Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I make mistakes all the time, probably every day. Oh, and definitely every day. <laughs> and so what do you do? You know, what do you do with those mistakes? Do you allow them to become toxic patterns and habits? Or do you find a way to accord yourself with this vision of virtue or piety that constitutes a narrow path, the stairway to heaven, as it were. Who makes it to heaven? You know, I just wax poetically about, you know, the virtuous person, whatever that means, you know, right? But the person who, who, who sort of, uh, who conducts themselves with some kind of dignity or nobility or virtue, piety, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 sort of adhering to religious values, such a one. But there's so much discourse in um, the Gospels about heaven is also for the poor and the downtrodden. This is a really interesting concept, I think. It's like the poor and the downtrodden are suffering here, and so they'll have the reward because they've kind of paid their dues. Now, there'll be the doubter may say, well, wait a minute. There's lots of poor, downtrodden people that are despicable. And there's some rich people who are nice and kind and generous. Wait a minute here. No, but, 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 the, but the narrative is such that the righteous and the downtrodden will, will, will make it into those narrow gates of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. There's this narrative that, uh, a very interesting narrative between the rich man dives and the, and the, and the poor man Lazarus. Um, and they, they both go to heaven and, and one gets rewarded in the other. And Abraham says to dives, you know, isn't this interesting, right? It's put in the mouth of Abraham. Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. You know, on the one hand, we could say, well, well, this makes sense. Surely the people who who assuming justice, assuming an ultimately just figure at the head of the, the world, uh, the universe even, that, uh, well, certainly the, those who have suffered will get their, their, their reward and those who have been indulgent or, or sort of un, you know, uncaring in some way, unthoughtful in some way, that they'll, they'll sort of receive their, their damnation. Uh, and... You know, if you were more cynical or skeptical, you may say, well, of course, this is the marketing message of someone marketing a message to the downtrodden. You know, you're not going to get followers on behalf of, you know, uh, the, the in crowd that's liking Judaism just fine. You may get some followers among people who are downtrodden. You know, what I'm saying is that these are the different kinds of questions or, or considerations that occur to people when they study religion. No, uh, we talked about this uh, last class, but specifically the end of days, the rapture. The idea that believers living and dead will be carried to heaven immediately before, perhaps during the end times, during after the Armageddon. Resurrection, following Jewish tradition, the belief that the dead will be raised and again in a new body, a body at the final judgment at the end of time. Debate has raged over whether this resurrection will be spiritual or physical one. There's lots of debate. There's no shortage of debate on that. Um, I think we talked about, we did it last time, but it probably would be good to know because there are two terms, you know, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. They're terms I think we talked about at the end of the Judaism chapter. And they're, they're, two, they're two sort of factions of, of, of the priesthood, of the Jewish priesthood. 
right? This idea, idea is shifting, right? So the Sadducees, Sadducees during the time of Jesus, this is why I kind of wanted to save it for this class because it makes, to me, it makes sense to introduce it in this context. The Sadducees during the time of Jesus argued against the idea of resurrection. You know, the, this is not something to be believed. This is not, you know, what we should believe. This isn't true, right? The Pharisees during the time of Jesus, they were proponents of the notion of resurrection as a means by which God might provide his gifts to those good people who had died after lives of suffering and devotion to God. Well, this isn't just a Christian question, is it? This isn't just a Jewish question, is it? This is the question of anybody who looks around at me like, how come really good people suffer? And how come really not so good people, they seem to be prospering? Of course, everyone's life is a shade of gray. Of course, everyone has areas of life that are heavily afflicted or blocked, and areas of life that are, 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 are functional, even robust. Of course, of course, of course, everybody looks at the other person and says, wow, I wish I had that guy's body. Wow, I wish I had that guy's power to speak. Wow, I wish I had that, the hall of mirrors that is reality, yeah. But there seem to be some people that do some wretched things that seem to get off, quote unquote. This is why we wanna punish people. This is why we have the impulse to throw them in jail and, where we the key, right? We want we want justice, and is justice just something that you know is a function of you know our species? Is it evolutionary? Is it brain chemistry? Is there a divine principle of justice in the universe that we're responding to, and you know we feel it in our soul when something's not fair? Is it um, you know where does this come from? How do we make sense of some people suffering and some people not suffering? And so one thought is, well, they get their, their just desserts in the afterlife. That's crucial. Now, the Sadducees who don't believe in resurrection, they ask Jesus this question and tries to trick him because in, in, in Jewish law at the time or custom or tradition, the idea is that when um, a woman's husband dies before her, that living woman should marry the husband's brother, right? So they say, look, let's see this is woman and, his husband, her and her husband has seven brothers and each of them die one after the next and she's married all of them. Then if we're all resurrected, who's, gonna, who's her husband? She has eight husbands? I think not. So clearly this idea makes no sense. What does he say? Do ye not therefore err because ye know not the scriptures, neither the power of God? For when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. What is he saying here? You know, this is like, isn't this just the, the question of all religions? What is he saying? What does this mean? <laughs> what does this mean? But he clearly he seems to be saying that, look, you think these squabbles we have about who's, who's married to whom and who's doing what, and you think this is what the, the, the eternal afterlife is like? I don't think so. We won't have need for these kinds of relationships in the afterlife beyond resurrection. We will be as the angels which are in heaven. Well, what are angels? Well, there's an ancient uh, Jewish tradition of messengers from God, angelic beings, uh, who exist in a spirit form, right? This is what he's comparing humans to. Uh, he's comparing uh, humans in the resurrected state to angelic beings, right? Popular conception often conflates angels and spirits of the dead. See, you know, you watch a cartoon or a show or something and someone dies and then you, you see them with angel wings. There's that conflation. But the angels are a class of beings who are obedient to God in the Old Testament and they're his messengers. And they're different from people who were once human who have passed away, right? They're non-material. But at this point, the, the, the sort of afterlife uh, theology is kind of fleshed out. And the idea is that the, uh, Satan is no longer in office. There's a, a personage called Satan, AKA Lucifer, and that he was a fallen angel. He was one of these, he's, he's the head honcho of the angels who erred, who chose to err, who chose to turn their back on God. Right? This is the narrative of the fallen angels. And do you believe in angels? I don't know. 69% uh, uh, of Americans believe in angels. That's a lot of people. Now, when Jesus is saying, as the angels, we're going to be as the angels when we're resurrected. 
you know, like, what does that mean? Is that like, we're going to be liberated from our body. We're not going to have a body. We're not going to need a body. We're going to have a spirit body. You know, does that mean the soul's different from the body? You know, like, like, what does that mean? Like, well, we're going to eat. Is there uh, <laughs> angel food cake we can eat? Is there something angelic we can eat? Is there a need for physical contact or procreation or sex or health? Do we get to work out in heaven? <laughs> what, could, what could it possibly mean? You know, this is an interesting deliberation. And there's, there's, there's lots, of, lots of discourse on either side of this. Now, I think our author is correct that it's a little challenging to make the argument that um, we have a physical body in the afterlife based on what Christ is saying, we're as the angels, right? Paul, uh, it is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There was a natural body and there was a spiritual body, right? This is a dualistic sort of idea here, probably influenced by the Greek, the Greeks. Now, you know, resurrection is not just a core component of the end of days, it's part and parcel of the status of Jesus Christ. You know, the story goes, I'm sure most of you know that, you know, Jesus was betrayed by one of his disciples and uh, he was persecuted. He was brought up on charges by the state and he was ultimately crucified by the Romans. This was not unique to Jesus of Nazareth or Jesus, Jesus Christ, if you will. This is, um, this was a common form of torture and execution used by the Roman state. Um, the story goes that after his resurrection, well, he's put in a tomb and three days later, um, Mary Magdalene, one of his disciples and some other disciples come along and they're like, well, where's Jesus's body? It's gone. And she runs back to tell his disciples, Jesus's body is gone. And they're like, what are you talking about? And like, well, no, we actually saw some angels there too. And they told us that Jesus had been resurrected. And they're like, what are you talking about? The resurrection is until the end of days. And you're probably just imagining it. You're really stressed out. You know, you know, they're there, dear. <laughs> and what happens? They start seeing sightings of Jesus. Now, are these sightings the same as when other people purport sightings of the dead? Are they different because of the status of this figure? Are they tantamount to, uh, are, do they evidence him having been resurrected in the way that we will all be resurrected in the days? Is it because he's the son of God, he was resurrected first and he's sort of now, you know, here presiding over the earth plane until the end of days, right? Is this, is this the fate we will all endure or we all have this sort of this, 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 this disembodied state um, or this sort of spiritual body or will it, be, will it be sort of very much like our actual body where we can eat? You know, we may have enjoy pleasure, right? We may have complex relationships. What's that like? That's crucial, right? But for Christianity, Jesus of Nazareth is Jesus Christ because he's a fulfillment of the promise of a Messiah from the Old Testament. He's also an exemplar, a moral exemplar on how to behave on earth, right? In that part of the world, because of his status, because of his exemplary conduct, uh, like his forbearance at the time of his trial, his ability to forgive um, Judas for betraying him because of his sort of moral for fortitude and because of his purported miracles. He was seen as certainly someone special, certainly someone anointed by God, you know, someone that was part of God's plan, someone who didn't die when he died. He just has a jump start on the afterlife and he's part and parcel of, of, of the navigation of the fates of people in the earth. He's part and parcel of that path towards righteousness at the side of God that you can steer your life towards if you so choose. Because like the angels who had choice, we do have choice and we can steer how we want. You know, he was more than a great teacher in the Christian context. He was more than a rabbi. Perhaps he was a revolutionary. Perhaps he was a reformer. But he was more than that. He was Jesus Christ, anointed by God. Next time, <laughs> the second half of the chapter, we'll talk about Christian theology. We'll talk about St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas, two important theologians, Christian thinkers. We'll talk about Martin Luther and his 
radical revolution and we will talk about Gnosticism and some very interesting mystical spiritual beliefs. And that's a wrap for today. I'll be taking Q&A as soon as I figure out how to stop share. And so let me just stop the recording for our purposes.